Well, hello, my name is Timothy Nesheim. I'm a geologist with the North Dakota Geological Survey. And today I'll be looking at the facies architecture of the Middle Three Forks Formation within the Williston Basin of Western North Dakota. Before I begin my technical material, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Sven Egenoff. He's a professor of sedimentology at Colorado State University. Uh, Sven has looked at some cores with me over the years and provided some invaluable discussions. Also, I'd like to point to Francis Nakachu, who is a PhD candidate at the Geology Department at the University of North Dakota. Francis has assisted me with some preliminary core log descriptions and also discussions over the last few years as well. So moving on to the introductory material, on the left is a regional map showing the approximate extent of the Williston Basin with the dashed black lines. Underlying that, you have the green shaded area, which represents the approximate extent of the Three Forks Formation. Overlying that, you have the Bakken Formation in the brown colored areas. You'll notice with the Bakken that there's a light brown and dark brown area. The dark brown area represents where the Bakken is at deeper depths, higher temperatures, and the organic rich shales have generated substantial quantities of oil and gas. The light brown areas represent where the Bakken Formation is at shallower depths and relatively lower thermal maturities, generating less to negligible amounts of oil and gas and ex not expelling anything into adjacent units. The black dots are your oil and gas productive well locations for both the Bakken and Three Forks formations. And you'll notice that those wells distribute largely within kind of western to northwestern North Dakota, uh, some into eastern Montana, southeastern Saskatchewan, as well as southwestern Manitoba. Overall, there's been on the order of tens of thousands of wells drilled and completed in the Bakken Three Forks Formation. Most of these wells are horizontal wells drilled in about the last 15 to 20 years, which have been hydraulically fractured to induce economic production. Uh, within Western North Dakota, where most of the production from the units is located, uh, the Bakken Three Forks is currently producing on the order of about a million barrels of oil a day and cumulatively has produced over three and a half billion barrels of oil and counting. On the right side is uh, some wireline logs showing a gamma ray through the Bakken Three Forks section and towards the top you'll notice those high darker green intervals which are your organic rich upper and lower Bakken shales. Those are your source rocks that have generated and expelled oil into adjacent units. The primary targets for horizontal well drilling and completion are your middle Bakken and upper Three Forks formation. Most of your horizontal wells primarily target the middle Bakken. Uh, the upper Three Forks is a secondary target that's not too far behind the middle Bakken in terms of cumulative wells and production. Between the middle Bakken and the upper Three Forks, there have been tens of thousands of wells drilled and completed. Secondary targets in the unit include the middle Three Forks and the lower Three Forks, which industry refers to as the second and third benches. Um, these units have experienced on the order of hundreds of horizontal wells drilled and completed, primarily in western North Dakota. With the middle Bakken and the upper Three Forks, there's been lots of published literatures on those units, partly because they've been drilled and produced for longer, and there's also a larger volume of wells. There's less publications available on the middle and lower Three Forks, uh, in part because these units started producing later within the evolution of the play, and also uh, they're not as productive to date. And so today's presentation, we're focusing on the middle Three Forks and trying to piece together a little bit of the geology and applying it back to the oil and gas production. Looking specifically at the middle Three Forks in western North Dakota, in terms of its total production and drilling activity, there have been over 250 horizontal wells drilled and completed in the middle Three Forks. Cumulative production of the unit is over 57 million barrels of oil, another 120 billion cubic feet of gas. And in 2018 and 19, the years leading up to the COVID pandemic, the middle Three Forks was accounting for about 3% of the total Bakken Three Forks production, coming in at around 30 to 50,000 barrels of oil per day. That may not seem like a lot, uh, but the middle Three Forks didn't start producing oil and gas until about 2014, 2015, whereas the middle Bakken started producing in eastern Montana in kind of its current play form in the early 2000s, and the middle upper Three Forks started producing in kind of the late 2000s. So the middle Three Forks was kind of the, one of the last reservoirs that showed up to be developed in the play, hence in part why it's, it, it has lower production overall. The last thing I'd like to point out on this slide or touch on 
is that the majority of those 250 plus horizontal wells drilled and completed in the middle three forks um, were drilled and completed after 2014, which is when oil prices were in kind of the range of about 50 to $60 per barrel for WTI pricing. And so with that larger activity in the middle three forks, it indicates the unit is economic to drill and develop at that oil pricing. So you don't need 80 to $100 barrel oil to get economic results out of the middle three forks in at least portions of the basin. This next slide, I've dropped in a water cut map looking at the percentage of water being produced out of the total fluids from the middle three forks horizontal wells. With this water cut map, I'd like to point out uh, that the first few months of production when the initial flow back of injected frac fluids occurs, those were removed from calculating this water cut map. And so you'll notice on the outer portions of the map, the blue colored areas, that represents where the horizontal middle three forks production is 70% or more water. The inverse of that is 30% or less oil production out of the total fluids. As you move in towards the central portions of the map in the red color areas, that represents where the water cut drops below 50% and oil production out of the total fluids climbs above 50%. And then the orange is kind of your intermediate area. And if you look closely, a lot of the horizontal wells in the middle three forks are positioned in and around the, the low water cut, the high oil yield area, where you're probably getting the best production. For this next slide, I've switched a few things in and, and dropped a few extra layers on, but first off, that central map is still the water cut from the middle three forks, but I've dropped on production bubbles. And those bubbles represent the cumulative oil production from the wells over their first 700 days of production. The larger greener bubbles represent where the middle three forks wells have cumulatively produced 300,000 barrels of oil or more in their first 700 days. The smaller circles that are less green are wells that have cumulatively produced less oil in those first 700 days. And so those larger, more productive wells for the middle three forks are located in and around those low water cut areas. Um, also on that central map, you'll notice the dashed outlines. Uh, so what are the controls that, that yield higher oil in the middle three forks? The thicker dashed outline area in the central portion of the map, that represents where the overlying lower Bakken shale is thicker and more thermally mature with respect to oil generation. And so where the lower shale is thicker, more thermally mature, it's generated and expelled a higher volume of oil and gas uh, per unit area. And in a sense, probably pushing more oil up into the middle Bakken and more oil down in the underlying upper, middle, and lower three forks. So where you have more oil generation from the lower shale, you have lower water cut and higher oil yield from middle three forks wells. On the left side of this um, slide, is a core plug fluid saturation map where cores that were extracted from the ground and operators measured oil versus water ratios from the pore space. And so in that darker green area on the left hand side map, that's where you have the highest oil saturations within the middle three forks core plugs. The lighter green area represents where you have intermediate oil saturations and the white areas where you have minimal to negligible oil saturations in the middle three forks cores. And so if you look at these two maps closely, the high oil saturation area from the cores overlaps with where you have the high oil production from the middle three forks, at least most of it. And that also corresponds with where the lower Bakken shale is thicker and more thoroughly mature. That light green area on the left with the intermediate oil saturations, that represents uh, approximately overlying with where you have the intermediate oil water fluid ratios from the middle three forks horizontal wells. And that intermediate area of oil saturations and, and oil production, that corresponds with where the lower Bakken shale is still relatively thick, 20 feet or more, but it's at more of an intermediate level of thermal maturity, generating a little bit less oil and gas per unit area. Uh, you'll notice as you move to the southwest of kind of the middle three forks production, you have an abrupt drop off in oil saturations and, and oil production, and there's not many producing wells. That corresponds with a northwest, southeast trending um, thick trend in the overlying pronghorn member.
And so the pronghorn member separates the lower Bakken shale from the three forks. And as that pronghorn thickens, you're getting less oil into the underlying upper and middle three forks. So that pronghorn thick trend, which is shown on kind of those horizontal gray lines on the left, that's part of the reason that production drops to the, to the southwest. However, there's a couple other questions I have with this unit that aren't addressed from this information I've put together so far. First off, when you look at that core production for the middle three forks, you'll notice some clusters of some very big, high oil producing wells within the low water cut areas. But adjacent to that, you'll notice these pockets of smaller wells that are less productive in terms of cumulative oil and have higher water cuts right in that central area. So there seems to be a lot of variability in terms of oil production from the middle three forks within its core acreage. A lot more uh, variability than you see in the overlying upper three forks and middle Bakken. Um, part of that has to do with uh, lateral length, that the few of those less producing wells, the, the horizontal lateral in the unit is a little bit shorter. Also it has to do with a little bit of the age of when the wells are drilled and completed. Uh, the older wells tend to be a little bit less productive. The newer wells tend to be a little bit more productive. Uh, but that only accounts for some of that variability. And so part of what I'm hoping to address in to today's material is to talk about why you might have so much variability in oil production in that core acreage. The other thing I'd like to touch on looking at the production and oil saturations of the middle three forks that caught my attention when I put this material together is on the left hand map you'll notice an abrupt drop off going from high oil saturations in the dark green intermediate oil saturations in the light green uh, to crossing that red line you suddenly have minimal to negligible oil saturations in the middle three forks cores with relatively high water. So I took that red line which might be a red line of death for, for middle three forks um, you know, prospectiveness for production and I transposed it onto our water cut bubble production map and you'll notice I have that as kind of an intermediate water saturation area in part based on the thickness thermal maturity of the lower Bakken shale but beyond that red line there haven't been any horizontal wells drilled and completed in the unit by industry. There have been a number of wells I believe permitted in that area to target the middle three forks but they were never drilled and completed. And so that red line is something that we'll get back to at the end of today's presentation material. Moving on to looking at kind of the stratigraphy and regional geology of the overall three forks section before we focus in on the middle three forks. On the left is a stratigraphic nomenclature chart that was put together and published by Garcia Fresco et al. in 2018. You know, one thing you'll notice on the left side of that column is a conodont zone. And um, for kind of more of the non-geologists, you might be wondering, well, what is a conodont and why do you have conodont zones? Well, a conodont was this worm-like organism that used to populate vast portions of, of, of Earth in the geologic history. Uh, these little worm-like organisms were, you know, little predators that they had these sharp teeth uh, that are preserved in the fossil record uh, that are shown on the bottom right-hand side of this slide. Uh, with conodonts, the key things of why they're important in the geologic history and, and why they're studied is that conodonts rapidly evolved from one species to another. And then the old species would become extinct or, or disappear. And then the new species would rapidly spread throughout vast portions of, of earth systems and environments. And as those conodonts were evolving and spreading, the, the morphology of their teeth was also changing very rapidly. And so there's a, a series of geologists or biostratigraphers out there that can go through and look at the, the shape and morphology of conodont teeth and get a pretty good idea of what the age of for the geologic sediments that those teeth are, are present within. So you might be thinking that the Three Forks formation is, is holding a bunch of conodont teeth. In actuality, there are no conodonts in the Three Forks formation. And actually, the, the Three Forks formation is known to be barren of any kind of fossils, regular fossils or trace fossils. And actually, the Three Forks looks like it was deposited in a relatively harsh environment that was not conducive to hosting organic material and, and preserving it. And so the Three Forks formation cannot be constrained based on its fossil assemblages because it has no fossils as we'll see a little bit in the core today. However, 
the Three Forks Formation is underlined and overlined by units that do have conodonts that have been studied by biostratigraphers. So the underlying bird bear and dupro formations, they have conodonts that are Frasenian in age, indicating kind of late Devonian deposition. And the Three Forks is overlined by the Bakken Formation, which have conodonts that are Feynmanian age to Tornasian in age, uh, which is late Devonian to early Mississippian. And so using kind of the conodont zones from the overlying and underlying unit, that constrains the Three Forks formation to being late Devonian in age. And so the Three Forks formation is, is approximately laterally equivalent to the Wobbeman group and the Palliser formations within the Alberta subservice and front range. And using that information, we can then look at kind of the regional paleogeography at the time of Three Forks deposition. This next slide looks at kind of the regional geology during deposition of the Three Forks Formation. And on the left, you have one of Blakey's paleogeographic reconstruction maps for kind of the Devonian, late Devonian. Uh, you have the darker colored blues to the left, which is your open marine, your open ocean environment. And as you move across North America, you'll notice the lighter blue areas, that's your shallow inland seas, and browns would be like your exposed uh, continental surfaces. Uh, I have the outline of the Williston Basin again in that black dash line with our study area represented by that red star. What you'll notice on the map is there's that intermediate blue colored area which trends to the northwest to the southeast based on current positioning of North America. That was a trough like depression that was extensive throughout the Vonian referred to as the Elk Point Basin. And so for many of our Devonian units, you have these open marine fossil assemblages, which include corals, uh, stromatoporoids, crinoids, brachiopods. So there are phases where the, the Williston Basin had this nice connection with the open ocean, and it had normal marine salinity conditions in a relatively deep water setting. During Three Forks deposition in the late Devonian, however, there was the development of the sweetgrass arch, was which, which was a paleotopographic high that formed right in the middle of the Elk Point Basin. And that topographic high basically restricted to cut off connection between the Williston Basin and the open ocean during Three Forks deposition. So at that time, the Williston Basin was still this depression where you had an infilling of water and sediments, um, but it didn't have a strong connection to your open ocean hence perhaps why the Three Forks Formation has limited fossil content. Looking at kind of the regional deposition, uh, this was a figure that was published recently by Franklin and Sarg in 2018. On the right side, you have FA3, the red colored area, and FA1, kind of a bluish colored area. That represents the Williston Basin, where you had uh, an interpreted intra-shelf siliciclastic enriched basin aka the Williston Basin. And it was bordered by kind of these storm mud flats. And so with Franklin and Sarg's work, they talked a lot about the influences of storm on Three Forks deposition. And in their model, they proposed kind of a variable connection with the open ocean that was restricted at times by the sweetgrass arch. Uh, Franklin and Sarg did note that you had some trace fossils or, or burrows that were distinctive of perhaps a marine influence within the, at least the upper portions of the Three Forks, but became less common as you move down in section. Uh, of course, laterally equivalent to that, as you move off to the left, which is moving to the northwest in the Elk Point Basin, you have those equivalent units, the Wabamun Group, the Palliser Formations, that have more of an open marine uh, depositional setting and are more of a pure carbonate versus a, a mixed carbonate siliciclastic system, as you see within the Three Forks Formation. Alternatively, Garcia Fresca et al. 2018 proposed that the Three Forks Formation was deposited within more of a playa-like depositional setting in which there was kind of a three-stage development that repeated itself for the unit. You had an initial stage of flooding uh, where you developed a brackish lake uh, in the Williston Basin and through evaporation and drawdown you then transitioned to a hypersaline lake and eventually you got to a point of dry stage where the entire basin dried off and you had subaerial exposure of the sediment. And then that cycle repeated itself multiple times. Garcia Fresca et al. made this interpretation based in part on the lack of marine fossils. There might be a few trace fossils, but there are no 
fossil shells, or definitive marine origin. And also, they pointed out that there's a presence of evaporite mineral and hydrite. And hydrite is much more common in the lower portions of the Three Forks and less common as you move up in section, but it's still present in the Three Forks formation. And to get that evaporite mineral and hydrite, you'd have to be in some kind of hypersaline to dry stage environment. So looking at the stratigraphy of the Three Forks formation, there have been a few different nomenclature systems proposed and utilized over the last few decades. One of the common systems utilized is from Christopher, 1961-1963. Christopher looked at the Three Forks formation in southeastern Saskatchewan and subdivided it into a six-unit system in ascending stratigraphic order. Christopher based this on wireline log responses, primarily gamma ray logs as shown here, and also core and drill cutting lithologies. Initially, when the Bakken Three Forks emerged as a prominent unconventional play in the Williston Basin, Julie and Richard Lefevre correlated Christopher's six unit system from Saskatchewan down into North Dakota. However, the Lefevres went on to kind of adopt and utilize a five member system in which the lower three members corresponded approximately with the lower three units of Christopher. And then they had this member four, which seemed to uh, correlate with the Christopher units four and five. And then the upper member five correlates approximately with member, with unit six. Additionally, you had Botchardal 2011 that proposed a more simplistic upper, middle, and lower member system for the Three Forks formation. In the Botcher nomenclature system, the lower three forks corresponds with the lower three members and units of the Lefevers and Christopher. You have the middle three forks that corresponds with member four and units four and five, and then the upper three forks correlates with the uppermost member and unit previously proposed. Additionally, on the industry side of things, there have been companies that have adopted and utilized a bench nomenclature system in which you have the uppermost producing reservoir in the Three Forks is the first bench. As you move down, you have the second bench, which is approximately equivalent to the middle Three Forks, units and members four. And then you have the third bench, which is equivalent to member two and unit two, and then this fourth bench at the basal portions of the Three Forks. Uh, now with industry, as they, they've moved across the different plays across North America, this bench nomenclature system shows up with a number of different formations. Um, the bench system works as an operator, I think, when you're planning your, your development of a given play. But when it comes to the geology, it, it leaves a few gaps. You have your first bench and second bench, but what about that intermediate unit? Uh, some operators refer to that as the intra-bench interval. And the same thing as you move between the second and third benches. But when you move to the third and fourth, there, there isn't really a break between the two. And so with the bench system, it isn't really clearly proposed as far as how and why it's subdivided into those four units. And they do roughly correlate with some of the previous nomenclature systems. For my presentation material today, I'll primarily be referring to the Botcher et al. system combined kind of with the Christopher six unit system. So for today's core walkthrough, we're basically going to look at three cores in detail that form a north to south transect across kind of the western North Dakota oil productive area for the middle three forks. We'll look at one core that's located up north towards the Canadian border, uh, where you have the northernmost producing middle three forks wells that are less productive. Our second core we'll look at is kind of right in the central portions of the Williston Basin, where you have your highest density and best producing middle three forks wells. And then our third core is actually a little bit south of this displayed area, and it's south of your area production. And then we'll kind of tie all three of these cores together with some other described cores to put together kind of a geologic framework for the middle three forks. And with that, we'll begin our core walkthrough. All right, so we've moved into our core labs at the core library here, and we'll start the core walkthroughs. Uh, shown here, I have a map of North Dakota with the extent of the three forks formation shown in the blue colors. Uh, as you move to the left-hand side, to the west, you'll see these black to green dots, and those represent the distribution of partial to complete middle Three Forks cores uh, that are present in North Dakota, where you have the oil exploration and development activity in the unit. The larger green circles are cores that I've logged and described in detail. The black dots are additional cores that I've looked at on more of a reconnaissance level 
that I'm planning to log a number of those in the future. These yellow stars are the three cores we're going to review in detail, and that A to A prime shows a cross section where I'll stitch together a bunch of the core log descriptions I have into a longer cross section that kind of pieces together like the, the various facies, architecture, and stratigraphy of the middle three forks and the bounding units. So our first core we're looking at and going to review is up here in the northwestern corner of the state. Pictured here is on the left are my wireline logs for the, the borehole. And this is from Continental Resources Rosenwald 130H. And so you have the wireline logs on the left uh, with gamma ray and green, um, density and neutron porosities in the center and resistivity on the right. As you move to the right hand side of this description, I have my core logging display where I have sedimentary symbols in the left hand side column, laminate geometry, core color, and then on the left you have grain size ranging from more clay rich to more grain supported uh, rock types. The first section we're going to look at is actually we're going to start with the lower three forks looking at kind of the Christopher unit two and three before we step into our unit of interest. One thing I noted earlier is you have the presence of the evaporite mineral anhydrite and anhydrite becomes less common as you move up in section. So looking at the core interval of what approximately is the Christopher unit two, which is the middle portions of the lower three forks. Kind of spray some water on it. Uh, but these kind of semi-translucent whitish colored irregular shaped blobs are the evaporite mineral anhydrite. And so you'll notice a number of anhydrite nodules within this portion of the three fork section. But as you move up, you lose your anhydrite nodules. As you lose your anhydrite nodules, you're transitioning from the Christopher Unit 2 into the Christopher Unit 3, which directly underlies the middle three forks formation. And so when you look at the wireline log display of this transition, you'll see a slight increase in the gamma ray wireline log response as you move up towards the top of the lower three forks. Uh, and your anhydrite nodules disappear. Uh, also, if you look at the coloration of this section, it's, it's mostly oxidized uh, with some green beds towards the bottom of this section, but also moving into kind of more of a massive oxidized section in kind of the upper part of the lower three forks. So when you look at the section of rock that underlies the middle three forks, it's kind of a massive, you know, poorly textured, oxidized red bed section. Portions of this interval, you'll notice that you can't see any visible grains with the naked eye. In other, in other portions of the core, you'll see uh, kind of small sand to coarse sand size particles within the finer grained matrix. So for portions of this interval of rock, uh, you'll notice that there might be a faint horizontal lamination texture that's kind of poorly, poorly developed and poorly observed. Uh, and overall, it's a fine grain matrix that you can't visibly observe any grains in the hand specimen. When you look at a thin section, uh, pictured here of this same interval, the top image here is a photomicrograph uh, from more of a zoomed out picture of this facies. And the bottom you have a photomicrograph where you've zoomed in uh, closer. And so when you look at the thin section, you'll see this finer grain clay rich matrix with these silt sized grains or mineral crystals. And then there are these blobs that have the light pink staining of the alizarin red, indicating that they may be comprised at least in part of calcite. As you zoom in to look at these silt sized grains or crystals closer, you'll see that they have kind of a cubic to rhombic shape, and they also haven't taken on any of the alizarin red staining. The cubic rhombic shape indicates that it's a carbonate mineral. The lack of alizarin red staining indicates that it is dolomite. <coughs> Dolomite is not a primary mineral of deposition. Typically, it forms after the rock has been deposited. Um, but in some cases, the crystal size of dolomite will reflect the original size of whatever mineral it's replacing. So it's possible in this section that you had silt sized carbonate minerals that were then replaced by the dolomite. And if you look at XRD, analysis from this facies, it has somewhere on the order of about 30 to 50 percent clay and then um, you know, equal to lesser amounts of dolomite and quartz. And so some of these smaller silt-sized grains 
our quartz mixed in with the dolomite. And so what I refer to this facies as is kind of a silty to sandy mudstone because it's very fine grain made up of mud. It doesn't have enough clay to probably really be defined as a clay stone, but there are silt sized particles in it. So the other representative facies of this interval is where you still have the oxidized uh, clay rich matrix, but you can actually start to see some visible grains to the naked eye, which are kind of sand to, to granule sized uh, fragment pieces. Looking at this in thin section, again, you have a more zoomed out picture taken in normal polarized light uh, to a more zoomed in image of kind of the central portions of this upper section. And that's taken in cross polarized light. What I'd like to turn your attention to is that overall you still have kind of the clay rich fine grain matrix. There's a few little silt sized grains or crystals in there, but then you're also picking up fine to fine sand to coarse sand sized particles. Um, and with those sand sized particles, you know, some of them kind of blend in with the matrix. And so it may be rip up class that have been redeposited. And then you have more exotic grains that have variable uh, compositions and textures that are fairly angular in size. And so in order to get a rock deposited like this, you have to have some kind of lower energy conditions to get the fine grained matrix, but you also have to have some higher energy, at least intermittently, to get the coarser grains that are moved in and deposited. Overall, you know, these class again, they're variable in size, composition, and grain shape. All right, so going back to the wireline log and core illustration display, we're now going to transition from the lower three forks into our unit of interest, the middle three forks. And there's going to be a color change going from your oxidized sediments into your non-oxidized uh, kind of green clay matrix. This transition on the wireline log shows up as you have a, a decrease in gamma ray wireline log signature. And there's also a slight increase in resistivities typically as well. Um, you'll have the appearance of some dolostone class um, that are sand to cobble sized. Looking at one of these dolostone beds on first pass, you might think it's featureless or textureless. Um, you can kind of spray some water on it and zoom in a little bit closer. And if you look at this core piece, that here's a photograph of this same core image, uh, where I've adjusted a little bit the contrast in Adobe Photoshop. At the base of this core interval, if you look closely, you can see these planar horizontal to slightly inclined laminations. Uh, which have been interpreted as being deposited under a current flow. As you move to the top of this core interval, you lose your planar laminations and you start to see more of a rippled texture. Uh, this is indicative of having some wave energy that's moving and transporting your grains. And as you get into the, the rippled laminated interval, you start to see scouring surfaces where the waves have dug into the dug in and removed some of the underlying sediments and redeposited the ripple deposits. And also as you move from the planar laminated texture into the ripple laminated interval, you start to see little clay seams. Uh, and to get that clay to settle out, you have to have lower energy uh, deposition and preservation of it. So here we're looking at a core sample where you still have the silty laminated dolostone facies you have some clay class that have been, at least they look like clay class that have been ripped up and deposited and then maybe some clay seams. Um, a thin section of this interval, you can see uh, kind of an inclined, inclined lamination where you go from coarser grain silt laminate to finer grain lower silt content intervals. So looking at another set of photomicrographs of that same thin section where we've zoomed in on a higher magnification to look at those grains individually, You'll see a lot of these grains, like I said, they're silt sized. Uh, they have kind of an angular texture. Some of them are a little bit more cubic. And if you look at the interference colors under cross polarized light, some of them have lower order extinction colors, more of just kind of a white to gray. And those are little quartz silt grains. Some of the other silt sized grains or crystals have a rhombic shape and they have slightly higher order interference colors where they have kind of a yellowish color. Those are your dolomite crystals. And so you have silt sized quartz and silt sized dolomite crystals. And that's why I refer to this facies as being kind of a silty laminated dolostone because it has silt sized quartz and, and dolomite crystals. Uh, and the laminations are sometimes either planar or ripple laminated. All right, so as you continue up in through the middle part of the middle three forks, 
you continue to grade between more of your class supported conglomerates with the big dolostone class. Uh, you'll also see some intervals that have uh, you know, more subtle class that are smaller in there. As you continue to move up in section for the middle three forks, you know, you'll grade between these laminated silty dolostone facies and your you know, matrix to class supported conglomerates. Uh, some intervals in the middle three forks, you lose the dolestone class and you have just more of a silty mudstone, but that makes up a very minor portion of the system. Sometimes those inner contacts are very sharp when you transition from one facies to another. Other times you have more of a gradational contact moving from silty dolestone up into the silty mudstone and back into some of the class supported conglomerates. And then as you get towards the top of kind of the the lower middle three forks, the Christopher Unit 4, also which industry refers to as the second bench, which is the reservoir target, um, you pick up kind of the final facies that we'll touch on. So within this final facies, below it you can see some of the matrix supported to class supported conglomerates. You get a little bit of the laminated silty dolostone um, with planar to rippled laminations and some thin clay seams. And then you get into a facies where you have kind of an interlamination between the laminated silty dolostone and then these horizontal mudstone laminations um, that have higher clay concentrations. And these thin mudstone laminations that are kind of a green to gray in color, they're relatively featureless. Uh, that you don't see the ripple laminations. You also don't have any little class sitting in them typically. Um, and they're only on the order of millimeters to maybe a, a couple centimeters thick in most of these cores. And now we'll look at a thin section from that facies interval. So this is the approximate depth from where this thin section came from. And again, you can see the laminated silty dolostone and kind of these featureless horizontal kind of green gray mudstone laminations. Looking at the thin section up here, you have a plain polarized light image at the top that's a lower magnification. Below is that, um, is that kind of siliciclastic mudstone lamination. And you can see there's only a few very small silt sized grain in an otherwise clay rich matrix. As you move up into laminated silty dolostone, you have a very abrupt contact with coarse sediment at the base that then finds upwards overall. And uh, this lower image, you're basically seeing the same thin section. You've just zoomed in on a section of kind of both of these two facies. Um, so overall, when you look at this siliciclastic mudstone, this is the finest grained, lowest energy deposit within this section. So as we continue up in section, uh, you see kind of that interlaminated facies between the very fine grain siliciclastic mudstone and the laminated silty dolestone. And that interval only expands maybe about one and a half to two feet at most. And uh, after that you start to get back up into where you see a little bit of the laminated silty dolestone with minor clay content. Then you get back into where you see uh, some of these conglomerates with dolestone and clay clasts that are intermixed. Um, <coughs> And right near the top of what I refer to as kind of the, the reservoir interval, Christopher Unit 4. And before you transition to the top of the middle three forks, you see a little bit more of the laminated silty dolestone that has maybe been a little bit broken up and brecciated. Now we're going to move up in the core into the Christopher Unit 5, which is the upper portions of the middle three forks. This is the interval that some portions of industry would call your interbench interval which is supposedly your non-reservoir. Uh, and you can see a slight increase in the gamma ray wireline log response that varies some, indicating slightly higher clay concentrations. And, and usually you do pick up a little clay in the XRD analysis. Uh, within this facies as illustrated here, you can see more of the dolostone class. Uh, mostly you have matrix supported conglomerates with a few um, intervals that maybe are borderline class supported. And as you move through this, uh, the upper part of the middle three forks, you can see that the class concentration kind of comes and goes. Uh, sometimes you have large cobble size, pebble to cobble size class, and other times you have very small kind of sand sized dolostone class. Uh, some of these intervals 
um, are kind of poorly laminated. Other times you can see a horizontal lamination at texture within it. All right, so in the upper portions of the middle three forks, here's a few representative pieces that, that you see. Some portions of the upper three forks, you'll see very small kind of sand-sized dolostone class within the clay-rich matrix. Other times, you'll see large dolostone class suspended within the matrix, and you can kind of see a lamination texture. And then other times, you'll get more of a class-supported conglomerate. And, and then there's other portions where you lose your dolostone class altogether. All right, so in the upper part of the middle three forks in the Christopher Unit 5, here's a thin section corresponding with this core piece. And this is one of the intervals where you've lost the dolostone clasts. Uh, looking at a more zoomed out image in normal polarized light, you can kind of see little silt sized uh, crystals or grains, um, which are pretty abundant in this sample, but you still have a pretty fine grain matrix. On the bottom picture here, you have a zoomed in view in cross polarized light where you can see some of those cubic shaped grains indicating that they're dolomite crystals. Um, so again, the thing pointing out here is that you have, you know, overall a finer grained rock, but you do have some silt sized crystals or silt sized grains um, within this facies. And also to point out, you don't see any kind of obvious horizontal lamination texture within at least the thin section. So when you put some of these representative facies all together, looking at the rock types side by side with the thin section photomicrographs, uh, and this is looking at kind of the non-class bearing sediments, um, you can see that there's silt size material in pretty much every facies uh, with the most limited amount of silt size material within these, you know, green gray siliciclastic mudstone laminations within kind of that inner laminated facies. And so when you try to think about what is the lowest energy deposit within this whole section, it, are, it is these small, you know, siliciclastic laminations that's interlaminated with a silty dolostone facies. So when you move through this middle three forks section, as you go kind of from the, the matrix to class supported conglomerates to your silty laminated dolostone facies that pick up a few of those really fine grain siliciclastic mudstones, um, it all looks kind of like a, a hodgepodge of sediments. And at this point, you might be stepping back and thinking to yourself, well, Tim, that's an interesting looking core of the middle three forks with its various facies and sedimentary structures, but it kind of looks like a mess. And the truth is the middle three forks is kind of a mess on first glance when you're looking at kind of the sedimentology and stratigraphy. Like I said earlier, as you grade between these various facies, sometimes the contacts are gradational, sometimes they're sharp. Uh, but when you're looking at kind of a typical stacking pattern where these facies kind of grade into one another without the sharp contacts, this is typically what you see on the right hand side. And so you have core photographs of what we just talked about with kind of illustrated lithologies. And so a typical stacking pattern I think that I see in the middle three forks is you get kind of the silty sandy mudstone at the base, uh, which is kind of what you see in the underlying lower three forks formation. As you grade up into the middle three forks at the base of it, you start to see these matrix supported to class supported conglomerates with those uh, variable sized dolostone class and sometimes thin clay class. And it's after that that you grade into some of these silty laminated dolostones that are sometimes flat planar, sometimes ripple laminated. Uh, and then the last facies that kind of shows up as you move through the stacking pattern is where you pick up those really fine grain horizontal siliciclastic mudstone laminations. Uh, and then as you move up further, you kind of grade out of those facies. And so you see an internal stacking patterns throughout the middle three forks, uh, but the base of it, you see it, um, kind of the, the beginning of this transition. And then as you move up out of the, the lower parts of the middle three forks into kind of unit five, you grade from kind of the, the laminated facies, silty laminated dolestones, and then back into your conglomerates. And then at the top of the middle three forks, right before you get into the upper, you see that silty laminated uh, mudstone facies again. So the next core we're going to look at is the Scar Federal, which is located in kind of northern McKinsey County, which was right in that area where you had most of the middle three forks production. And so we've moved south from the previous core, the Rosenwald. With the Scar Federal core, it only extends partway down into the lower three forks, and so we don't get a complete picture of the underlying section. 
Um, but based on core log correlations, it does capture about five feet of the underlying unit uh, before we transition up into the middle three forks. Again, as you transition from the lower three forks, uh, you can see a drop off in the gamma ray wireline log response, which makes it correlatable across most of the basin. All right, so when you first start to look at the underlying upper portions of the lower three forks formation, you'll see kind of a greenish gray color uh, where there are some small uh, grains that you can see in there um, and a little bit of a poorly developed lamination texture. Um, but otherwise, it's a pretty fine grain deposit. Also within the upper portions of the lower three forks, you can still see kind of that kind of yellowish green color, but you start to actually pick up some dolostone class in the upper parts of the lower three forks. Uh, some of these dolostone class, they look like they were kind of soft and a little bit deformed. Others uh, a little bit more angular. If you look closer, you might see a little bit of an internal lamination texture to some of those clasts. And if you'll notice looking at kind of the core illustration, as well as from the actual core itself, you'll notice that this section is not oxidized as it was in the previous core. So this next core interval is the approximate contact from where you're transitioning from lower three forks into the middle three forks, which is right as the gamma ray wireline log is decreasing. And so you'll notice somewhat of a sharp contact where you're going from kind of the greenish yellowish color into more of a gray color. There's a little dolostone class that start to show up, uh, but I'd describe it as being more of an intermediate to gradational contact. So as you move from the lower to the middle three forks, the contact is not a very sharp, abrupt contact in most of these cores, but it's, it's generally gradational. And with this next core piece, you know, we've moved just a few feet up into the middle three forks. And here you can start to see relatively abundant dolostone class. There's a subtle horizontal lamination texture to some of them. Um, it also has kind of a, a finer grain matrix that this probably is overall matrix supported with maybe some of the classes touching each other. So as you move up through the lower portions of the middle three forks, you continue to see a relatively similar facies where it's the class bearing matrix supported conglomerate. So moving up a few more feet around the 91 foot mark, uh, you can see these dolostone class that are, are pebble sized to smaller and they're hosted in kind of a, a finer grained matrix. And uh, some of these dolostone class, for the most part, they're pretty angular. And also there's a subtle lamination texture to them, indicating that that, that silty laminated dolostone facies was deposited. It was pretty well lithified or indurated before it was ripped up and redeposited. So as we continue to move up in section in the middle three forks, we eventually come to some intervals that are very much classed supported with those dolostone clasts. Uh, and with these dolostone clasts, you can see that they're irregular shaped. And so they were probably soft and squishy when they're ripped up and redeposited. And also within this interval, you'll see a lot of these clasts kind of have uh, a little bit of a peak texture to them. Um, and with that texture, it's indicating that you might have fluid escape structures where after deposition continued um, overlying sediments, we're kind of squishing these sediments and forcing water upwards through the rock column. So moving back to referencing my, my stacking pattern figure, uh, in the lower three forks, you had a little bit of the silty, sandy mudstone, uh, but then you picked up your, your matrix supported conglomerate pretty quickly with some dolostone clasts. Most of the lower portions of the middle three forks, you were seeing matrix supported conglomerates. Uh, to maybe a few intervals where you had classed supported conglomerates. And so you're only seeing the lower portions of this stacking pattern through kind of the lower half of the middle three forks uh, from what we've looked at so far. As we continue up into the middle three forks section, we'll start to see the laminated silty dolostone uh, where the facies have been somewhat brecciated. It hasn't been full on ripped up and redeposited. You can see these large class have been maybe moved and readjusted a little bit, but they're still probably relatively in situ. And you can see the ripple laminations. Uh, maybe some of these are more of the planar cross stratifications. They've just been deformed a little bit. But you're getting into what I would call here is maybe a class supported breccia to the silty laminated dolostone facies. So now we're getting up towards 
the upper portions of, of the middle three forks, uh, the Christopher Unit 4, which is the second bent re bench reservoir. And you can see some of the silty laminated dolostone facies. And then you have those green gray horizontal featureless uh, siliciclastic mudstone laminations, which again is your finest grained uh, deposit. Um, if you look closely, there are these little uh, little dikes of silty dolostone that cross-cut the, the siliciclastic mudstone laminations. Uh, some people looked at these features and interpreted them as being mud cracks, so that this facies would have been subaerially exposed. Uh, however, if you look at those little features, a, a typical mud crack forms a downward V-shape whereas these little features are not V-shaped, but they're instead these little compressed tubes that shot through. Uh, so an alternative interpretation of these being mud cracks is that they're sinuresis cracks, which have to do with variable salinity. And so the way that sinuresis cracks can form is upon deposition in the water column, you may get uh, a more hypersaline water with more total dissolved solids that's underlying a more lower salinity water with less dissolved solids and you get denser fluids overlying less dense fluids leading to a little bit of a compaction that that forces um, sediments to shoot through different layers and so you'll notice with these sinuresis cracks uh, that they go from one silty laminated dolostone interval to another shooting through the siliciclastic mudstones uh, and so it doesn't appear that these siliciclastic mudstone laminations have been subaqueously exposed, but they were deposited subaqueously. Okay, so we're going to continue to move up in section, moving from kind of the laminated silty dolostone facies with those inner laminations of siliciclastic mudstone. Um, and as you continue to move upwards, you get back into where you have the, you know, the class bearing matrix supported conglomerates. And so again, you can see little pebble size to smaller dolostone clasts. Uh, some are more angular, some are rounded, uh, but they're suspended within kind of a, a more fine-grained matrix. <clears throat> and this sample is actually coming right along where there is the interpreted contact between the upper part of the middle three forks, Christopher Unit 5, and the underlying kind of lower middle three forks, Christopher Unit 4. And so this contact between these two units is relatively gradational, that you see kind of the same facies below and above. The only thing that really sh that, that must show up is you have an increase in your wireline log gamma ray signature, indicating there's a slight increase in clay concentration moving between these two units. As we continue moving up in section into the upper portions of the middle three forks, the, the Christopher Unit 5, you know, most of that section you have the matrix-supported class-bearing conglomerates or class-bearing class bearing silty mudstones, uh, but there are a couple beds that are kind of one to two feet thick where you lose the dolostone class, and you have kind of this greenish gray silty mudstone. This facies on the wireline log signature does usually correlate with a slight increase in the wireline log gamma ray signature. So as you move up from the middle three forks into the upper three forks, uh, you just kind of see that same stacking pattern that I've, I keep repeating here. You have your silty maybe sandy mudstone underneath, which is the top of the, the middle three forks. You then get into a classed bearing to class supported breccia with dolostone clasts. And above that, then you grade into a kind of silty laminated dolostone facies. Um, so it's kind of like a similar stacking pattern to what we saw in the middle three forks. Uh, it's just you grade right into the silty laminated dolostone facies. There's less of the conglomerate. So kind of going back on an overview of the SCAR Federal core in the middle three forks, uh, you still see that same stacking pattern that you see some of the silty sandy claystone at the base. Uh, but for most of this core, you just grade into the conglomerates. And that's where you are for most of the core section. And it's not until you move towards the top portion of the reservoir that you start to see the silty laminated dolestone that then picks up the uh, siliciclastic mudstone laminations for at least a little bit as we touched. Um, so again, like overall, you see that same stacking pattern. You're just not seeing as much of those um, silty laminated dolostone facies. Another point I'd like to make from looking at these dolostone class conglomerates 
from like the Scar Federal versus the previous core we looked at, the Rosenwald. This is that um, matrix supported uh, conglomerate and overall it's a pretty competent rock that you can't scratch it with your fingernail even though the matrix is pretty fine grained the dole stone class are pretty well embedded in there if you were go to back to the previous core here's your dole stone class conglomerate and so the dole stone class you try to scratch them they're pretty well competent and indurated but you get into that clay rich matrix and <laughs> it just crumbles and breaks apart so even though you might describe this as kind of a similar facies of a you know, Dolestone class conglomerate, this one is a lot more competent versus this other, this other sample over here. What I'd point out before too, the Scar Federal is in a location uh, where they're drilling and completing horizontal wells in this unit. And indeed, if you look at the wireline log uh, core display, I have oil water saturations from the core where the blue is showing water saturations, uh, the dark gray is showing oil, and you can see through the middle three forks, you have uh, equal to larger amounts of oil in the core plugs versus the water. And so the Scar Federal is, is where the middle three forks is producing, and the primary reservoir that they're getting oil out of are these Dolostone class bearing matrix supported conglomerates, where the matrix is a lot more competent than in some of the other um, matrix to class supported conglomerates. One thing that was discussed or reviewed in a master's thesis by a student from Colorado State University, Lauren Drogi, uh, she described some of these conglomerates as having more of a clay rich matrix, while other conglomerates had more of a dolomitic matrix uh, supporting the larger class. And so I don't have the XRD data or the thin sections to confirm it at this point, but my suspicion is in that central portion of the barrier, in the central portions of the Williston Basin, where you're having a lot of the good production out of the middle three forks, is you have um, more dolomitic matrix within those uh, competent conglomerates, which is then taking on your hydrocarbon charge and, and allowing it to be produced. So now we're going to move on to our third and final core. And so we're continuing our north to south transect across western North Dakota. The third core we're looking at is Continental Resources, the Brecken, uh, 1-3-H. And it's located south of that main area of production from the unit, and actually south beyond where there's any production out of middle three forks wells. Looking at the wireline logs of the Brecken and kind of core description, we're first going to touch on a, a couple intervals from the underlying lower three forks. Uh, just kind of getting a better understanding of, of continuity and repeat of facies in the overall section. I haven't quite done my core description all the way down to the underlying three forks formation, um, but one thing I'd just like to point out again, like we saw in the first core, is you can see anhydrite nodules that show up again in the lower three forks, where you know you have some oxidized, you know, fine grain beds, unoxidized, and then there's your anhydrite nodules. Uh, which again, we haven't been seeing anhydrite nodules in the middle three forks, so that's kind of one diagnostic feature separating the two units. So now we're going to move up a little bit more in section, but we're staying in the lower three forks. Uh, this would be the upper portions of Christopher Unit 2. Uh, this is what industry refers to as the third bench of the three forks, where there have been on the order of dozens of horizontal wells drilled and completed. So what you can see on this facies is it's not quite as pronounced, but you do have the laminated silty dolostone facies. Uh, and there are some scouring surfaces, and also, if you look really closely, there's some wave ripples in here as well. Um, similar to what we're seeing in some of the middle three forks and even the upper three forks, uh, but it's not as pronounced as you get in the third bench. And also noting within this interval, you're lacking the anhydrite nodules. So as we continue up into kind of the upper portions of the lower three forks, which is a Christopher Unit 3, uh, you're getting again a little bit more higher of a gamma ray log signature indicating a little bit more clay. You lose your laminated silty dolostones and just get into oxidized, uh, oxidized facies. So one thing as you move up into this interval in the core is uh, you see a lot more clasts or grains within the oxidized matrix. And some of these class are getting to be pebble sized. And so you're ranging from kind of, you know, fine sand to pebble sized fragments, 
with an overall fine grain matrix. And those grains are suspended throughout kind of the whole interval. The whole oxidized interval is a lot more grainy. Even though it's still matrix supporting, you're just seeing more of those small grains, small clasts. So as you continue up from the lower three forks into the middle three forks, you don't really have a well-defined obvious contact between the two units. And you'll actually see where I've drawn my contact between them is kind of right in the upper portions of that kind of silty, sandy, oxidized mudstone. Um, and when I look at the regional stratigraphic cross-section I'll show a little bit later, that'll make more sense. Um, and so the bottom few feet of the middle three forks, you're just continuing to see, you know, that class-bearing, silty, sandy mudstone. You can start to see a little bit of a lamination texture to it, um, <clears throat> but you're not seeing any of those silty dolostone class, or if they are there, they're just very small and not obvious. As you move up into the middle three forks, you have to go several feet up in section before you get into your first silty dolostone. Um, and that silty dolostone, it's only a few inches thick, and you have the oxidized silty sandy mudstone below it and above it. Um, and then you grade into several more feet of kind of oxidized facies. So as you continue up in section just a few more feet, then you start to see your conglomerates where you have your dolostone clasts. Uh, here they're a little bit more irregular shaped, uh, that they were probably plastic, more plastic ductile when they were ripped up and redeposited. Uh, you can also see portions of this where it looks like you have clay clasts that kind of were ripped up and deposited in some kind of debris flow. As we continue up in section, so we get, s we get somewhere on the order of several feet to 10 feet of where you're having more of those dolostone clasp bearing conglomerates. Um, which are mostly matrix supported, sometimes class supported. Uh, and then we finally get a few feet where you get the silty laminated dolostone beds with the ripple laminations to the, the planar cross stratification. And in those silty laminated dolostone beds, you start to see those very fine grained siliciclastic mudstones uh, on the order of just a few millimeters to centimeters on the order of thickness. Um, and so that's where you're you only have a few feet of that facies in this core, which is a lot less than you were seeing further northwards. So now we're moving to the top of just that, that several foot bed interval of the silty laminated dolostone as we basically come out of that facies. And so what you see is with the silty dolostone, uh, you still have a little bit of that very fine grained siliciclastic mudstone, but it's decreasing in its concentration. Also what you'll see here is what I believe might be a ball and pillow structure that's present occasionally in the middle three forks cores. Uh, bottle, ball and pillow structures, they're a soft sediment deformation feature that's typically believed to be caused by a brief high energy event, such as like an earthquake or meteorite impact that shocks the sediment before it's well lithified and then causes that soft sediment deformation. Um, but in terms of back to like the stacking pattern, as you come up out of that silty laminated dolostone facies, you get into a clasped supported conglomerate for just a few feet, and then you get a thin bed of the silty sandy mudstone that's fully oxidized. So now we're continuing upward stratigraphically. We've left behind the silty laminated dolostone facies, and we've back, we get back into a several foot interval where you have the matrix supported to class supported conglomerate with those dolostone clasts. Uh, then you get an interval where you have more of a silty, sandy mudstone matrix with a few small class, and then you continue up in section towards kind of the upper portion of the middle three forks unit four, uh, and you completely lose the dolostone class, and you just have the silty, sandy, oxidized mudstone for the remainder of the section. So one thing that I like about the Debrecken is it really kind of shows up in, it mimics my overall stacking pattern that I picked up from the other cores. And these cores were basically taken out of the Debrecken middle three forks section in order. And at the base of it, you have that silty sandy mudstone uh, that doesn't have any kind of the dolite dolostone class. Then you're going to get your uh, conglomerates with your dolostone class, your silty uh, laminated dolostone facies that's kind of right in the middle. And so you kind of see that stacking pattern moving upwards. You get a few of the that those very fine grained siliciclastic mudstone laminations. Uh, 
then you get back into more of the class bearing to class supported conglomerates and then back into your silty sandy facies. And so overall the Debrecken represents kind of just one stacking pattern or one cycle for the middle three forks. So to kind of summarize the Debrecken core for the middle three forks, if you look at the middle three forks section, uh, there's a fair amount of that silty sandy mudstone facies that has no dolestone class and it's fully oxidized. Uh, in the middle of kind of the, the lower middle three forks, the Christopher unit four, you only have a few feet of the silty sandy laminated dolestone facies. And beyond that, you maybe have half the remaining section or so with those dolestone clasts. And so as we move southwards, we're losing that silty laminated dolestone facies. We're also decreasing the amount of the conglomerates with the dolestone class making up the facies and we're picking up more of that silty sandy mudstone facies. And when you move to the upper part of the middle three forks, Christopher unit five, it's almost exclusively comprised of the silty sandy mudstone facies uh, with only a few dolestone class that show up in one thin interval. Okay, all right, now we've reached the end of the presentation where I try to put all this core information together into one coherent picture. And as I mentioned after we walked through the first core that the middle three forks is kind of a mess stratigraphically. And if you look at my work shirt here, it's kind of a mess. So this is kind of the point that I'm gonna to try to clean up this picture and put together something that's a little bit useful. And so one thing, if you remember through all the cores I walked through, I kind of emphasized looking at stacking patterns at the middle three forks, showing how the various facies that comprise the unit are stacked on top of one another most commonly. The reason you do this is you're trying to get insights into how these different rocks were deposit deposited laterally adjacent from one another in a depositional setting. And so when you get a good stacking pattern put together for a given unit, all you have to kind of do is turn it sideways to get an idea of how these rocks were deposited laterally from one another, assuming they were deposited laterally from one another. And so starting towards kind of the deeper part of the basin, that this is my depositional cross section, um, kind of the progression of facies, and over here you have the C that was kind of, um, <clears throat> and out to the left of this map is showing kind of the deeper water deposits within kind of the Elk Point Basin, the Williston Basin. And so in the deepest portions of sedimentation for the middle three forks, you had deposition of those very fine grained siliciclastic mudstones, which were interlaminated with the silty dolestones. And those are being deposited somewhere below your fair weather wave base where those really fine particles can settle out of the water column, where they can form a little bit of a thin lamination or a thin bed. As you move up dip from that, you move above the fair weather wave base into your silty laminated dolestone. And this is the area where you have regular wave action that's moving around your sediments, creating those wave ripples. And then you have your planar uh, cross stratifications where you have some, perhaps some alongshore current or current energy moving the grains back and forth before it's deposited. Uh, as you continue up dip, you start to see your conglomerates, uh, which are sometimes class supported, sometimes matrix supported. And as you continue up dip, you get into the class bearing silty mudstone and eventually into the silty mudstone that has no dolestone clasts. And so that's kind of a general look at the deposition, but you might ask yourself a question here, at least if you're a good geologist or, or good sedimentologist, and you might ask yourself, Tim, why do you have silty dolestone facies that are somehow being deposited and ripped up up dip of your environment? Well, I think the way you do that is you have a multi-step process uh, to kind of deposit those silty dolestones and then to rip them up and redeposit them. And so next I have kind of about a five-step process that probably repeated itself numerous times during middle three forks deposition. The first step, you have kind of a semi-stable depositional setting where you have your um, interlaminated silty dolestone and those fine-grained siliciclastic mudstones in the deepest portion of the basin. As you move up dip and you get shallower water where you have regular wave activity, you get your laminated silty dolestone and then up dip from that you get your silty sandy mudstone that's typically oxidized. And at this point you don't have any of those conglomerates forming. 
The next step uh, is you have some kind of, you have a base level rise, which is where either eustatic sea level rises and or there's basin subsidence that occurs faster than sedimentation, and your coastline pushes inland. And as the coastline moves inland, so your depositional facies also move. And so you start getting silty dolostone deposited over top of some of your silty sandy mudstone. And after some phase of deposition, you move to the next step where there is a base level fall, either through eustatic sea level drop and or maybe a little bit of uplift um, or just sedimentation infilling the basin. And so your facies move basinward. Uh, then you start to exo expose some of your silty laminated dolostone to the atmospheric conditions. Um, after maybe a phase of erosion, you develop uh, some kind of sea cliff right along the margins of, of the coastline. And once you have that sea cliff, you have a, a little bit of elevation or a topographic high, and that is where your debris flows can occur, and those conglomerates form as those dolostones sometimes interbedded with your silty sandy mudstones uh, collapse. And sometimes those, those conglomerates have been partially reworked by wave energy and sometimes they haven't. Uh, sometimes they're class supported, sometimes they're matrix supported. And so you can imagine this, this multi-step process happening again and again over the course of the middle three forks deposition. And that's why it's a mess. So now we're going to move to a detailed stratigraphic cross-section uh, which stitches together the wells we looked at or the cores we looked at with a series of other cores that I've logged in detail. This transect starts up uh, towards the Saskatchewan border and then it moves progressively southwards as we move from left to right. So you're moving more deeper basin area uh, landward to shallower areas. In your outermost cores, the, the Baja, the H. Bakken, which are proximal to that first core we looked at, the Rosenwald, you'll notice that there's the silty laminated dolostone occurs near the base of the middle three forks, in the middle of it, and including up towards the top of at least the middle three forks reservoir interval, which is your second bench. Uh, the next core over, you continue to have some of these silty laminated dolostones forming throughout the interval. And you might even be tempted to say that maybe these intervals are approximately, uh, can be correlated with one another. Yeah, maybe they can, maybe they can't. And at the base of the middle three forks in this area, you see the um, conglomerates with the dolostone clasts right at the base, underlined by the silty sandy mudstone of the lower three forks. Continuing uh, landward or, or towards the central portion of western North Dakota, um, you start to see where the basal part of it, you see more and more of the conglomerates extending further up into the section. You still have some silty laminated dolostone, um, but it's getting pushed up further into the section. You're seeing not as much of it near the base of the middle three forks. Then you move into kind of the central portion of the study area. This is including the Scar Federal Core, which was the second core we looked at, uh, along with the Bernice Core from Newfield Production. And this is right in that heart where you have most of the middle three forks production. And you have the highest oil saturations and the highest oil cuts from the wells, also corresponding with where the lower Bakken shale is at its deepest, higher, highest thermal maturity. And in these cores, you'll see that the conglomerates make up basically about the lower half of the middle three forks section or more. Um, and it isn't until you get to the top of the Middle Three Forks Reservoir, the second vents, that you start to see a little bit of laminated silty dolostone. So your primary reservoir in that primary production area are the conglomerates, and those silty laminated dolostones are only making up a small amount of the section. <clears throat> Continuing even further landward, you still see some of the silty laminated dolostone within kind of the upper part of the Middle Three Forks Reservoir you'll still see the dolomite conglomerates, but if you look at the matrix, it's generally red to green clay-rich matrix. We're back with these wells, it was more of a competent uh, dolomitic matrix um, that was harder and probably more inducive to hydraulic fracturing, where the more clay-rich intervals may be less inducive. And at the base of the middle three forks, you'll start to see an interval of a few feet thick uh, where you don't have dolostone class and you just have a little bit of the silty sandy facies. Also in this core, uh, the Hoven 15-1H, there's also an interval right in the middle of the middle three forks reser reservoir interval 
uh, where you have the silty sandy matrix or silty sandy mudstone facies without the dolostone clasts. Then you have a little bit more conglomerate moving back up in the silty laminated facies. Um, continuing inland, the next core here is the Debrecen core, which was the third and final core we reviewed in detail. Again, at the base of the middle three forks, you have several feet of that silty, sandy uh, mudstone facies. You might ask me, well, why isn't that part of the lower three forks? Uh, well, if you look at the stratigraphic correlation between uh, lower three forks unit two and three, where you go from that silty laminated dolostone facies that shows up in the lower three forks, or the, the third bench as industry refers to it, you know, you can draw that surface between the cores, and that surface shallows as you move from the Hoveden to the Debrecen. And so assuming that this interval stays a relative similar thickness, uh, and actually you still see, now well, you lose the gamma ray wireline log response. But I'm just assuming that you pick up a few feet of that silty sandy mudstone at the base of the middle three forks equivalent. Um, you still have some of the conglomerates that form within the middle three forks, uh, but a lot of the matrix, it's more clay rich and oxidized for most of it. You have a little bit of the silty laminated mudstone or silty laminated dolostone in the middle of the middle three forks, uh, but there's only a few feet of it. And a lot of the conglomerates are more matrix supported. As you continue in further inland, there's an, one more core that I didn't review in detail today, the Rundle Trust, but here you'll notice that you have uh, about six or seven feet of that silty sandy mudstone at the base of the lower three forks. You get a a thin interval of just a few feet where you have a class supported conglomerate, you move back into more matrix supported conglomerate, most of the middle three forks section is oxidized and you don't have any of the silty laminated dolostone facies. And so as you move basinward to landward, you're losing your silty laminated dolostone facies, then you start to lose your conglomerate facies, the section becomes progressively more oxidized and it's also thinning as you move landward. Um, and just to touch on it briefly, if you looked at the upper part of the lower three forks, which is Christopher Unit 4, uh, there's kind of a similar story where on the landward side it's completely oxidized. There's a few scattered dolostone class, but it's mostly made up of that silty, sandy dolostone facies. If you move back basinward, um, back into the central portion of the study area, you'll start to see dolostone class extending out throughout much of the section and you lose your oxidation. And you continue back out uh, basinward towards the northern portions of the study area and kind of the northern four cores, that unit five of the, the upper part of the middle three forks is completely unoxidized and you have dolostone class that uh, progressively become more common in the section and you even start to get some uh, class supported conglomerates as you move basinward in that unit. All right, so now we're going to move through a series of facies maps. And so a lot of the middle three forks, I don't think you can really correlate distinctive beds all that often. But what you can look at is the ratio of your different facies, of your silty laminated dolostones with the wave ripples versus the, the conglomerates with the dolostone class versus the silty sandy mudstones that are, are typically oxidized. And so the facies maps I've put together are only including kind of the uppermost six wells of that previous cross section we reviewed. And so it doesn't quite include that Debrecen core that we reviewed. Um, so the first facies map I have is kind of looking at the percentage of the silty laminated dolostone, which is making up the middle three forks reservoir interval, the Christopher unit four. Um, or the second benches industry refers to it. As you move towards the north, northeast portions of the study area, this silty laminated dolostone starts to make up over half of the middle three forks reservoir section or more. And as you move towards the south, southwest, it progressively makes up less and less of the overall middle three forks section. This next map over here is showing the, the net feet of the silty sandy mudstone which is typically oxidized, containing those silt to sand sized to sometimes pebble sized grains. There's usually a few feet of that facies and sometimes it's not oxidized in the central to northern portions of the study area, but it only makes up a minor portion of the section. However, as you start to move towards the south and southeast, 
uh, you start to pick up more and more of this within the, the middle three forks reservoir interval um, until you get to like the Debrecken and the, and the Rundle Trust cores where this is making up getting close to half of the middle three forks section or more and so that's increasing as your silty dolostone facies is decreasing and so this this last facies map on the far right here I put together and I would say this is probably one of the ugliest geologic maps I've ever put together I had high hopes for it when I started and it just didn't really seem to come together in, in time um, but what I'm trying to show here is you have different facies regimes based on the average makeup of the middle three forks uh, unit four the lower middle three forks and so up to the north you have the silty dolostone facies belt where over half the section is that laminated silty dolostone um, and then in the heart of the basin in this purple area that's supposed to show where you have conglomerates that are with those dolostone class that are making up on the order of 70 or 80 percent of the middle three forks section and so that's my conglomerate facies belt and in between these two you have kind of a transitional area and then to the south you also have a transitional area where you start to pick up that silty sandy mudstone and so eventually as you move south I think the entire middle three forks will be comprised of just silty sandy mudstone and you'll completely lose any dolostone class or silty laminated dolostone facies altogether. So that's an overview of the, the geology and the sedimentology, stratigraphy of the middle three forks and maybe how it was deposited and how the various facies are distributed. The last thing I'd like to do is to tie that back to oil and gas production from the unit. And in order to do that, I'm going to talk about reservoir properties of the various facies. Like I'd mentioned earlier, um, there have been lots of studies in the upper three forks and the middle Bakken, but minimal studies in, in the middle to lower three forks. So to start this final portion of the presentation, I have to go to some references that looked at reservoir qualities in the upper three forks. And the upper three forks has similar facies, uh, just in different ratios. And so um, the thesis or the publication I'm going to review today results from is Kyle Peterson from 2017. Uh, Kyle was a graduate student at the University of North Dakota. Uh, there's also a couple other studies that, that looked at the same facies uh, with different approaches and came up with similar results. There was uh, Riley Brinkerhoff completed an AAPG poster presentation, and then there was a follow-up master's thesis by uh, Ada Doyen, which you'll see in the references. With Kyle Peterson, what he did is he looked at the nuclear magnetic, magnetic resonance, or NMR properties, looking at the pore size pore size distribution within the upper three forks facies. Um, and so on Kyle Peterson, he has this ternary diagram where in the bottom left you have micropores, which are your smallest pores, and they're going to be the least likely to take on oil charge, and also the hardest pores that produce oil from if they in fact do contain hydrocarbons. To the top of this ternary diagram, you get to your macropores. Which, is, are you, which are your largest pores in the rock and most likely to take on oil charge and also to yield oil production upon completion of a well. The bottom right is your mesopores, which are kind of your intermediate sized pores. So the first facies that Kyle Peterson analyzed was what he describes as the massive green mudstone facies. And this is equivalent to the silty sandy mudstone facies without the dolostone clasts to maybe containing a few dolostone clasts. And with this facies, you'll notice that it's kind of equal parts micropores and mesopores, and its overall has your smallest pore system. Kyle noted that it generally had the lowest oil saturations from the core plug analysis, and therefore is likely your lowest quality reservoir. On the other end of the spectrum, he had his clean to laminated dolomite facies, which is equivalent to what we refer to as today as the silty laminated dolostones. And so with this, you can see that over half the pores in this rock type are comprised of macro pores. And the remaining pores are more of the intermediate mesopores, and there's very minimal micropores. So overall, this facies, Kyle noted it to have the largest pores and the highest oil saturations, and is likely your best oil charged reservoir and your best oil productive reservoir. The interesting thing about this is if you looked at net porosity, the total pore space, this dolostone facies that had the biggest pores actually had the overall smallest total porosity, whereas the other facies, the green mudstone, generally had some of the 
highest porosity. And so just total porosity is not the whole picture, but it's the size of the pores and the connectedness of the pores uh, that relates back to your reservoir properties. And indeed, in the upper three forks where you start to see more of this massive to laminated dolostone facies, that's where you generally have better oil production from the unit. Intermediate of that, um, Kyle identified and analyzed samples of that interlaminated silty mudstone and that very fine grain siliciclastic mudstone. And uh, that facies had variable reservoir properties, sometimes having really low quality pores, other times having larger pore systems similar to the more clean delaminated dolostone facies. And if I bet you went back through Kyle's samples, the ones that had more of the thicker clay laminations or siliciclastic mudstone laminations, those are the, probably the ones with the lower uh, pore sizes. Whereas you move up into the higher reservoir properties of this facies, it probably had less of those thin siliciclastic mudstone laminations and more of the silty dolostone. The last facies that Kyle sampled and analyzed is what he called the clean to model dolomite. And this appears to be equivalent to those conglomerates that we emphasized in the middle three forks, especially within the area of production. And so those doloclast conglomerates also had variable reservoir properties, sometimes having very low or small pore systems, similar to the uh, silty sandy mudstones, and other times having larger pore systems, similar to the clean laminated dolostone facies. The way it looks with Kyle's results is you have, where you have more clay, you have smaller pores and a lower quality reservoir, and where you have less clay and more dolostone, you have bigger pores and better reservoir, and then you have the intermediate facies. Um, and all three of these we find in the middle three forks, particularly the dolostone conglomerates. So the last step of this presentation today is we're going to tie the, the geology and the facies back into hydrocarbon production from the middle three forks and, and kind of the perspectiveness of future exploration and development in the unit. So if you remember back at the beginning of the presentation, I showed a couple maps, including one was the oil saturation from core plug analysis. And so that's oil saturation is measured right off the middle three forks cores extracted. And so you had the dark green area where they had the highest oil saturations, light green, intermediate, and white is where you have minimal to negligible oil in the, the middle three forks cores. And the one thing I emphasized was that you had this red line to the southeast where there was a relatively abrupt drop off in oil saturations in the unit, which was a little bit anomalous. And that red line also represents uh, where industry has not drilled or tested the middle three forks as of yet. And so why is that? If you take our facies map, uh, looking at kind of that conglomerate facies map and overlap it with the production bubble map of the middle three forks, you'll notice that the majority of those middle three forks wells are right in that conglomerate facies belt. And as you move to the southeast, that's where you're transitioning from more of the conglomerate facies belt into that transitional area where you're picking up more of the silty, sandy mudstone, which is more clay rich, probably has smaller pores within it, and is less of a prospective reservoir both to take on oil charge and to produce it. Uh, through well completions. And so it could just be a facies change as to why you're losing the oil saturations in the middle three forks that is just less able to take on hydrocarbon charge. Um, one thing that you might note is you have this little pocket of production beyond the conglomerate facies belt. Well, if you look at the core control that I've looked at and described, I've looked at a core just south of that little extra pocket of production another core that's just to the north of it, but I haven't looked at intermediate cores. So it could be, as I examine more cores from the middle three forks and eventually tie it into non-cored wells, that conglomerate facies belt might dip a little bit further to the south and overlap with that little extra pocket of production from the unit. The other thing I talked about in the earlier parts of this presentation was the high variability in oil production from the middle three forks and the quick changes from high water cut to low water cuts within that core acreage for the unit. Uh, one thing with that conglomerate facies belt, if you go back to Kyle Peterson's work, is that his conglomerate facies had highly variable pore size distributions. Um, 
Some of that facies had very small pores, a poor quality reservoir. Other times it had very high quality reservoir, in particular for the, the three forks, and other times more intermediate. So it could be back on this production map, those areas where you see the larger, more oil productive middle three forks wells, that could be where those, those conglomerates have more of a dolomitic matrix. Uh, they have a, they're more competent to hydraulically fracture. Maybe they have larger, more connected pores to take on oil charge. And then those other pockets where you have higher water cut in the middle three forks and you have smaller oil production, that might be where those conglomerates have more clay, less dolomite, and they're less able to take on oil charge. And if they do take on oil charge, they're, they're more difficult to drill into and hydraulically fracture for production. So with that, that concludes my core workshop presentation for the annual 2021 Williston Basin Petroleum Conference. Uh, I do appreciate your time and attention, and I'd be happy to have any follow-up questions and discussions uh, with anybody that views this presentation at some point in the future.